It is now my pleasure to introduce our very first speaker of the morning session, Ori Zoltis. Thank you, and it is a pleasure to be here. Just checking. Okay, that works. Um, last week, Phil Eliasoff, whom some of you have heard of, I think, or even just heard a few seconds ago, did a very far-reaching and very interesting introduction to the exhibition, fitting the work of Arthur Schick into a broad series of questions that are art historical, historical, and specifically the one that he kept driving toward was, and why isn't Schick better known? Um, this symposium and the exhibition are part of the process of changing that reality. And last night, Stephen Luckhart, in his uh, wonderful keynote, talked in a pointed way about what, in some respects, is Schick's most renowned and I don't know what to say his most important work is, but at the time it was incredibly important, and that is, of course, his caricatures, which were part and parcel of the visual war against Nazism. My intention, the title of my talk, Arthur Schick from Sea to Shining Sea, is to give a kind of broad uh, introduction to him, uh, many of the threads of which will no doubt be teased out by my colleagues over the course of the day. Certainly one of the most extraordinary individuals to arrive on these shores during the catastrophe of World War II and the Holocaust was Arthur Schick, and he turned his hatred of prejudice into brilliant visual expression. He combined a unique style. He synthesized the most extraordinary of medieval and Renaissance illumination concepts, so you've been staring now appropriately enough at a 12th century illuminated manuscript, as you can see, it's hell, appropriate for the context. By contrast, one of the images from the early 15th century by the Lamborg brothers of the Trerich Ur that give us quite the opposite, a solution to hell. It's, of course, the Annunciation, and we recognize the angel Gabriel with the lilies that symbolize the Virgin's purity, and all of the wonderful stuff that's going around the margin that makes it so compelling. And by contrast, the, from the same series, they didn't only deal with sacred subjects, the Lamborg brothers, but we see the Duke du Berry who sponsored the whole thing, um, the gentleman to the right there, the heavyset gentleman in the blue cloak. This is the month of January, and we see people still exchanging gifts. And on the fourth hand, this is an image from the, um, the, uh, an illumination that pertain to the uh, ninth century Sajja Gaon's book of uh, doctrines and opinions. And you see to the left, Moses going up Sinai with the Decalogue raised before him. And I call your attention, aside from the rich color and the gold, lavish use of gold leaf, to two interesting little features that were not uncharacteristic. I don't want to say characteristic, but not uncharacteristic of depictions of Jews by Jews in illumination. So you'll notice that all the men have these funny hats on their heads. This is ultimately one of the developments of uh, an idea uh, that because Jews are associated with the Antichrist, and Stephen mentioned the Antichrist last night because of course Schick flips that around. Hitler becomes the Antichrist, the son of Satan by a Judean harlot, whereas the Christ is the son of God by a Judean virgin, that therefore they have horns and one of the outgrowths of the Fourth Lateran Council of 1215 that required the Jews have some mark on their clothing so their neighbors could identify them, in some places, particularly north of, of the Alps, evolved to this horned hat that takes different forms. And on the other hand, look to the further right, and you see all the women, and they have, of course, not human heads, but animal heads, which was another aspect of a more than occasional Jewish manuscript illumination in the medieval period, because I don't want to compete with God by depicting humans. But if I depict humans that are partially animal, maybe I'm not doing that. So the most famous such work you all know of probably is the Bird's Head Haggadah, but there are others, and this particular manuscript plays with both of those ideas. So Schick was aware of this kind of material, and he combined it with a modernist sensibility that innovated rather than merely reinvigorating or updating a prior art form with simultaneously particularist and universalist subject matter. So this is a work by Schick. This is for Canterbury Tales, hardly a Jewish work, but you can see, in fact, that he has designed this to look very much like a stained glass window. Or on the other hand, and now we're getting almost into the canonical style of illumination that he is developing, and this one, I believe, is downstairs. 
Uh, no, it's not. Okay, similar ones, but not this one. Sorry. This is, of course, Joan of Arc, Jeanne d'Arc, um, th this very important saint who had become, by the 20th century, an icon much more than a specifically French or specifically Christian kind of figure, a figure of heroism, a figure of martyrdom, a figure of feminism. You're going to hear more about that following my talk by Ellen Umansky. So Schick transforms the manuscript illumination idea. And early in his life, he had studied in Paris and in Krakow, his home country, Poland. He spent some time actually in Palestine in 1914 as part of a group of Polish Jewish artists and writers, but that visit was cut short by the outbreak of World War I. And in fact, toward the outset of the war, he was conscripted into the Russian army and he fought at the Battle of Łódź, which was his hometown, about which you're also gonna hear about more later today, in November, December of 1914. After 1927, he kind of divided his time between France and Poland, and by 1937, he had moved on to England, and he arrived, as uh, Philip mentioned, to permanent residence in the United States in 1940. Of course, wherever he went from sea to shining sea, he carried with him this prodigious talent for endless, perfectly rendered detail that he applied by way of watercolor, gouache, pen, pencil on paper, in unprecedented style and quality that made him arguably, arguably the outstanding miniaturist and illuminator of the 20th century, as well as the most important visual political satirist of his era. Images in black and white or color are typically filled to bursting with figures, with objects, with background elements, often within equally detailed frames reminiscent in their richness of oriental carpets, all overrun with overt and covert symbolic vocabulary. Schick's works explode in diverse directions. In the period between the wars, he illustrated a range of secular and religious literary works, from Flaubert's, sorry, I did not mean to do that, from Flaubert's The Temptation of St. Anthony from 1926, and of course, that's what you see here, a rather unique representation of that idea, to Pierre Benoit's novel The Well, the following year, 1927. So too, he update an aspect of Jewish art, his 1925 Megillat Esther, not actually in Esther's scroll, but the book of Esther in book form, offers a lush expansion of the Jewish calligraphy and illumination tradition. So these are two scenes from this extraordinary work. You can see on the left um, the image of Ahasuerus and Esther, and then her very fierce looking uncle Mordechai to the far left and you recognize his playing with decorative elements that kind of fall somewhere between the Assyrian and the Babylonian on the one hand and the Achaemenid Persian on the other hand. I'm looking at that figure um, uh, next to uh, Mordechai's arm. And then of course on the other hand, on the other side, we have Vashti celebrating um, among the women and she's about to be called in by her husband to dance for the men and she's gonna say, Another feminist response, I don't think so. You guys have been doing nothing but drinking for a week. I think I'll stay in with the women, and of course that would lead, alas, for her to her demise. Preparatory studies of key characters created the previous year for this book are in and of themselves intense portrait images in their own right. But his magnum opus between the wars was the series of 48 illustrations that he created over a six-year period between 1932 and 1938 to embellish the Passover Haggadah. These vie in magnificence and excel in richness of detail and perspectival brilliance, the most stunning of medieval Haggadot, and set a standard against which subsequent works to the present day must be measured. And of course, you recognize in this scene the Pharaoh's daughter up top and Moses, the infant Moses, has just been discovered. And so we see him being lifted up towards the Pharaoh's daughter. Perhaps that is his sister Miriam in the lower right, a little bit concerned and on the other hand relieved. He's just been saved, but will he be saved? And she's gonna come up with a brilliant idea of suggesting her own mother to become his wet nurse and so on and so on and so forth. Uh, and note again, it's not just the scene itself in all its glory, but even the frame around it he has designed, as I said, kind of like an oriental carpet. It was the project of supervising the publication of the Haggadah that brought him to London. But shortly after he had begun to produce these drawings, he had already also begun to move in another direction, 
producing caricatures of Hitler in both black and white and color, at least by 1933, the expanding ugliness of political developments in Europe led him in turn to invest his Haggadah illustrations with topical allusions, allusions, excuse me. Thus, and here we see briefly another Haggadah scene. So like the Duc de Berry, Plurich Ur by the Lamberg brothers, we have both sacred scenes and contemporary scenes. So this is the young man practicing or reciting the four questions to that very fierce Mordechai-looking father or grandfather who peers over him. So I don't see that Schick is overly kind to a lot of people in terms of the expressions he gives them, and not just to the bad guys. Well, let's get to the bad guys. Everyone knows the four sons. There's the wise son. There's the, ew, the, the wicked son. There's the, the foolish son or the innocent son, and the son who's so dumb he doesn't know even what to, uh, how to ask the question. So you look in the lower left, he's got this kind of peasant-looking character. He's punning on the phrase am ha'aretz, people of the land that in Yiddish becomes amaretz, which refers to someone who just you know, can't even read his own name. That's the kind of figure he's gotten. And you've got this very uh, devout, pious-looking, perhaps, character on the upper right. You've got this rather jaunty character on the lower right. But the evil son is a portrait of Hitler. He's got that nice little mustache. And you have to look carefully, but that's who it is intended to be. He also embeds into the Haggadah portraits of Goebbels, portraits of Goering, others among the Nazi brass appear among the cruel Egyptian leadership together with swastikas placed at appropriate places. Hitler was said, you've heard this a couple of times, certainly last night it was raised to Stephen in a question to him. He was said on, in a July 13, 1940 article in the Halifax, Nova Scotia Morning Herald to have put a bounty on Schick, although as was pointed out last night and some of us were talking about it with Irv this morning, there's never materialized any definitive proof of it. The Germans themselves have been researching in their archives, so we don't know. But what was also pointed out last night was that Hitler was very conscious of people who made fun of him and didn't like it, including Fritz Grunbaum, who was recently in the news, who was an entertainer who did that and found himself hauled in by the SS because of that. So it's possible, but it's certainly not serpent, certain. In any case, the printing process for this work of the Haggadah took three years, perhaps extended by the redo compromises Schick was forced to make by his English publisher with regard to some of these images. Now, whether this was due simply to the publisher's sensibilities or to pressure from British politicians, who still at that point were pursuing the policy of appeasement toward Germany, is not clear. But in any case, by the time the work was done, he was on his way to America from sea to shining sea. The initial reason for his trip was to generate American support for the Polish government in exile and for the British war cause. But he'd already developed a following in the United States. One of his history series was a group of more than 30 watercolors, George Washington and his times. And so here we see one of those images, George Washington leading his troops, George Washington the soldier. It was a tribute to the Revolutionary War and to the first American president, which he had begun in Paris back in 1930, and it was exhibited at the Library of Congress in 1934. This series led to a commission from the American government to, desi to design a George Washington Bicentennial Medal. So too, 20 paintings devoted to the contribution of Poles to American history was exhibited in the Polish Pavilion in the 1939 New York World's Fair, and this one is downstairs. Correct? This is, of course, Kosciuszko, that very important soldier who was uh, even in our American elementary school teachings about the Revol Revolutionary War brought up as someone who allied himself with us. So Schick arrived into this country to an already warm welcome within both the arts and the political communities, which makes it a bit ironic that he could not enter directly but immigrated to Canada in July 1940 before making his way over the border six months later. If not ironic, then certainly interesting was his choice not to gravitate to the burgeoning art scene in New York City with its substantial Jewish presence at that time already, but to establish his base of artistic operations, as Phil pointed out, in the very different atmosphere of suburban New Canaan, Connecticut, did you say exactly 12 miles from this site? You've measured it, I presume, exactly from where I'm standing or where you're sitting. Something like that. We'll check Google Maps. 
but then the thing is, his unique form of visual self-expression drew from world events and literary, I, literary ideas channeled through the sieve of his rich imagination and singular artistic skill, and less from the art world and its discussions per se. So from 1950, done in Connecticut, this is a page from a second book of Esther, in which you see he's embedded himself as simultaneously the scribe, the illustrator, and as it were, a character on site recording events. So you see him there looking up toward Haman, who is hanging, as happens at the end of the book of Esther. But you may also notice that there are a lot of swastikas on Haman's garments. So Haman has become, as it were, an archetypical or the archetypical Nazi. Not surprisingly, one side of Schick's art that expanded during the 40s in America focused on heroes and villains. His 72 caricatures, War and Kultur in Poland, already exhibited in London in 1940, emphasized, and I'm quoting, the brutality of the Germans, the more primitive savagery of the Russians, the heroism of the Poles, and the suffering of the Jews with an immensely powerful cumulative effect, as a reviewer in the London Times had put it. And as we saw brilliantly discussed last night in part by Stephen, I don't mean in part brilliant, I mean partially discussed, he didn't discuss it all. Just to be clear about that, Professor Lockhart. He caricatured leading American isolationists, as Stephen also pointed out, like Charles Lindbergh, whose pro-Nazi sympathies were keeping the US out of the war. Conversely, his black and white 1943, Out of the Depths de Profundus, which Stephen also showed you last night, piled figures and faces together with a decalogue and a beautifully dressed Torah beneath an empty sky in which the words from Genesis 4, as you can read, as we did last night, Cain, where is Abel thy brother, can be found, calligraphized. I just want to point out three details, two of which Steve pointed out last night, that embedded, and you can't see it from here, take my word for it, in the C of the, of the, of the letter, uh, of the name Cain, is a swastika. And in the A, there is a Star of David. So Cain becomes the Nazis, Abel becomes the Jews. Again, it's part of his symbolic language. The third thing to which I'd call your attention is if you look carefully in the, up, in the left, who is it who has cradled in his arms not only a couple of kids, but the Ten Commandments themselves? It's Jesus with the crown of thorns on his head. So it is a very profound play on the words out of the Psalms, out of the depths I called, which are quoted by Jesus while he's on the cross. It interweaves a number of ideas. You don't need the ideas to appreciate the brilliance of the art, but it just adds another kind of series of layers to things. His brilliant shaping of works like the 1945 Samson in the Warsaw Ghetto with a bedraggled but very well-armed Jew striding over the fallen figure of a Nazi officer and old and young characters crowding into the frame together with other images, caricatures of Hitler, Mussolini, Hirohito, and others continued to pour forth as he reshaped his life and that of his family in America. And this, of course, you also recognize as another of these extraordinary covers for Colliers that he did. And as Steve pointed out last night, while uh, Norman Rockwell was doing Saturday Evening Post, um, sort of neck and neck, um, Schick is doing Colliers. And if you compare them, Rockwell's work is fine. But Schick's work has colliones that are lacking from Rockwell, and I'll ask those who want to translate that to translate that at their leisure. But you recognize Hitler, and you recognize Mussolini, and you recognize Hirohito, and you recognize a Nazi skull, and you recognize the Satan behind all of them, and the plan to overwhelm the world, and so on, and so on, and so forth. This sort of material continued to pour forth as he reshaped his life and that of his family in America. Eleanor Roosevelt called him a one-man army for his uplifting work as the American participation in the war finally unfolded after December of 1941. Indeed, his drawings were said to have become more popular with American GIs than pin-up girl posters from Europe to the Pacific Rim, from sea to shining sea. In America, Schick also continued to illustrate books, from Biblical Job to the Rubaiyat of Omar Khayyam to Hans Christian Andersen's fairy tales. I mean, this is just spectacular. He, we've got Hans Christian Andersen, of course, in the right, 
and we've got all kinds of characters from different Hans Christian Andersen's uh, fairy tales throughout with the Snow Queen all the way up there on the upper left and so on and so on and so forth. To a new edition of the Book of Esther, I showed you that image a few moments ago that comes from that new edition. All this stuff continued to pour out and his illumination skills carried in new directions. He was inspired by the 1941 State of the Union, the Four Freedom Speech of Roosevelt, and so he calligraphized it embedded in the richly detailed and colorful style that was his artistic fingerprint. This does not mean that he was either blind to or failed to respond to the failures of America to live up to its assertions as a bastion of freedom. He saw the racism, as Stephen mentioned last night, as Philip called it to our attention a week ago. He saw the racism so paradoxically present and he extended his war imagery to encompass the Ku Klux Klan and American soldiers. And so we see a black GI depicted commenting to a white GI. You can't quite read what's, whoops, sorry, what's uh, along the bottom there, but I'll read it for you. He says, it would be an appropriate fate for Hitler to be transformed into, quote, a Negro and to drop him somewhere in the USA. Among Schick's reported happiest moments, as Philip commented in going through his timeline this morning a moment ago, was Israel's coming to existence. And he devoted considerable ink and paint to celebrating that event. So this is the extraordinary illumination of the Declaration of Independence to which Philip referred that falls full circle back to where he began with manuscript illumination, except the manuscript here is neither biblical nor out of some medieval tome, but the Declaration of Israeli Independence. One might wonder what he would illuminate today in that troubled corner of the world. His autobiographical comment on his work was simply that I am but a Jew praying in art. He understood his output to be informed by a social consciousness and a sense of imperative to improve the world, tikkun olam, as it is said in Hebrew, that synthesized his Polish, his Jewish, his American, his international, his human identities. Thank you all very much. Thank you.